Ready to elevate your leadership? Follow Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast now. Transform inspirations into actions. Hit follow and lead with impact. Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. This is a very special episode because today, March 12th, Dale Carnegie and Associates presents the release of the new book, Lead with Influence, a proven process to lead without authority. This book emphasizes the importance of positive influence without a position of authority in the workplace, highlighting how individuals often fail to utilize this superpower and instead merely respond to requests and take orders. It suggests that by learning to leverage this untapped potential, individuals can break down silos, improve collaboration, and drive organizational success. Our guest host for today, Dale Carnegie's Chief Operating Officer and Chief Marketing Officer, Christine Buscarino, will be interviewing the author of the book and president of Dale Carnegie North Central U.S., Matt Norman. Christine, welcome. It's fabulous to have you in this role. I'm going to turn it over to you to proceed with our conversation. Thank you so much, Joe. Today's guest is an award-winning author and coach who's helped Fortune 100 corporations, nonprofits, and entrepreneurial firms transform the way they engage employees and clients. He's a third generation leader in the Dale Carnegie business, and he leads the largest North America operation in the Dale Carnegie network. He recently published his newest book, Lead with Influence, a proven process to lead without authority. Please welcome the president of Dale Carnegie, North Central U.S., Matt Norman. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here with us today. You know, we're all super excited about your latest book, Lead with Influence, and just the great feedback you've gotten so far, and really the impact that it can make on so many people across the world. You know, Matt, Everybody wants to know who you are and why you wrote this book. So we'll get into all of that. But I would love to first just really better understand. Tell us a little bit about the book and what our listeners want to hear and who is the target audience and why. Thanks, Christine. So it's really anyone that wants to gain cooperation, buy in, support from others without telling them what they should do or without forcing people. So there's different types of influence. You know, there's positional authority-based influence, power-based influence, manipulative-based influence. This is really about collaborative-based influence and relational-based influence where we're building trust and working toward a solution with others. And the target audience, I will say, is a mid-level leader within an organization who has achieved a level of positional authority based on subject matter expertise, tenure, or maybe process responsibility within an organization, who often is trying to influence and gain support from others across the organization and may be tempted to use their positional authority, their subject matter expertise to drive change within an organization. These are really a set of tools and a process that they can use to build trust and build their personal brand and reputation across the organization. Having said that, parents, executives, emerging leaders, and I think there's tools in there for everyone. Well, we'll talk in a couple of minutes about how some of those things I think definitely can help you at home, at work, in your professional development. And I'm sure you have a lot of personal experience there. You know, I think what's really interesting is the book really touches different aspects of your career progression, but helps no matter the situation, you influence in a way that people gain confidence in you. And also you take a leadership position, sometimes when you don't even have the authority and title to have it. 
So it sounds like this is a great tool for a lot of individuals. And I know there's a great class too that Dale Carnegie has been running for some time that you've been really successful with in your territories. Could you tell us just a little bit about some of the people maybe and some of the takeaways that they left with that our listeners can also get from reading the book? Absolutely. So we've had a lot of different types of people in different roles benefit from this program. I'll start with engineers or technologists who have really benefited. I start with them both because of my own personal bias. I began my career as a technologist and found that I was more comfortable in front of a computer sometimes or working through you know, tangible problems to solve than the ambiguity of interpersonal relationships or having to you know, communicate my ideas in meetings. And that's what brought me into the Dale Carnegie business is taking a Dale Carnegie program several years ago to help relieve some of my anxiety and improve my skill set in those areas. And because of that, I think I've tended to migrate towards technologists as participants in this program. It began with a conversation I had with a technology leader and that leader's learning partner who had the challenge that their technology leaders were viewed by their business partners internally in the organization as order takers, as transactional doers, sometimes as roadblocks to progress. And they wanted to position that team more as a strategic partner, as true consultants to their business partners. And so I put together this program to really provide them with tools and a series of communication patterns that they could use in their interactions, as opposed to relying on technical jargon, relying on subject matter expertise, or just being overly, in some cases, reactive to the needs of the business, that they would be more proactive and earn a seat at the table it was really effective for them. And so that has evolved into this program that now people have benefited. We work with a lot of marketing teams, human resources teams, operational teams. We also work with financial advisors, scientists. We had someone participate in the program who is the general manager for a restaurant chain that was trying to convince the owners of that restaurant chain to expand the menu offerings of the restaurant. And so you can see there's this broad application for people that don't have necessarily positional authority, but they're trying to gain willing cooperation and mutual agreement towards shared commitments. You know, I think that's great. I think what's so important about this book that maybe in other books you don't get is this is your words based on experience with a number of individuals at different levels in different industries and some of those proven leadership principles and tools that have helped make them more effective leaders. And I mean, think about it, you yourself, right? You just told your story. You started off in a much different role and now you're leading a team that teaches people how to be great leaders and great communicators and great negotiators, such a transformation in yourself as well. And, you know, to that point, I love the real world examples that you just talked about to show the application of what the book goes through really works, right? This is not just based on a set of ideas. It's based on real case studies of individuals who have gone through and used the tools that the book offers in a very simple manner, if I could save so myself. You've done an excellent job laying it out so that a person at any level can truly understand and grow from what the book offers. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, it's really based on its foundation, Dale Carnegie's over 110 years of background in helping people build relationships and lead in more effective ways. That comes out in the book. For me personally, I needed a foundation of confidence before I could apply the concepts in this book and write this book. As I mentioned, I had a level of anxiety and insecurity and suboptimal performance when it came to building relationships and communicating, especially in a work context. And so my early experiences with Carnegie were really to help me just expand my comfort zone, speak up, share my ideas in meetings 
and build relationships in more effective ways. This book, as you say, layers on a level of process or mechanics to how we have better specifically influence without authority conversations. And that's really what it's meant to be is, as you say, it's meant to be a set of very practical, actionable, tangible ideas. And it's based on all the work that we've been doing. I've been doing work in this area for the last decade, as well as research and reading other thought leaders and so forth in this area and try to really encapsulate all of that, the coaching that we've done at Carnegie in this subject matter area, and then also incorporating other key thinkers and so forth. So a lot of examples, a lot of specific tools in the book that should be able to be applied right away. That's great. You know, our listeners, they listen because they love to hear leadership stories. And I think what is so real in all of the different guests we've had over the last few years is they weren't born exceptional leaders, right? Everybody grew up learning something and facing challenges and growing from them. So part of what our listeners love to hear is that growth towards leadership story. And like many of our guests, your career is exceptional. Your legacy with Dale Carnegie is incredible. Tell us a little bit more about your leadership story and why you decided to continue to build and expand your leadership inside of what is a family started business. Yeah. I always admired and appreciated what my dad and grandfather did working in the Carnegie business. My grandfather got into the business in the 1960s and it was transformative for him and his family and his relationships and his career. And so my dad went to work for his dad, my grandfather, and had a ton of success. Both my dad and my grandfather are role models. They're idols for me. They're people that I constantly strive to be more like. Yet I never aspired to join the business. I wanted to do something, as I mentioned, in more of the technical space. I gravitated towards technology and wanted to be in a very entrepreneurial environment. And so that was my focus out of university. And as I mentioned earlier, I reached a point where while I was effective and the teams and organization that I was with were very effective, I felt that I was stuck in some areas. I felt like I was held back in terms of my confidence, my effectiveness in certain types of meetings, certain types of interactions. And so I began my growth journey by participating in a Dale Carnegie program. And it was so effective for me that I decided our company at that time was purchased by another organization. I thought that would be a good exit opportunity for me to join the Dale Carnegie business and really help others who may be stuck or held back, whether it be insecurities or anxiety, or whether that be just lack of the tools or skill set to be able to have more effective relationships and lead in a more impactful way. And that has set me on a growth trajectory. It's become my life goal is to help myself and others continue to grow. I believe it's one of the primary objectives that we should have as human beings. Always grow. Dale Carnegie believed that all of us have unrealized potential. And I've really embraced that idea and tried to encourage others around me to join in that journey. That's great, really, to hear the inspiration behind why you do this and why you love what you do. And, you know, similar to other authors like Joe Hart, who wrote Take Command and Michael Crom, it's a love and a passion for what you do that inspires really the labor of love to write a book. This isn't, you think of a concept and the book is done and you go to production. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that writing and production process and investment that you made in time and not just sharing the tools and the principles to help get there, but the life experience. So could you just talk a little bit? I'm sure everybody would love to hear that you're not a first time author. This is, I think your second book. But this one, I think, is so close to what you do every day and so close to your personal story. It's truly inspirational and a reflection of the life you've lived. So would love to hear just a little bit about the behind the scenes. Yeah. So I began writing intentionally or for public consumption about 14 years ago. 
At the time, I felt that I was not a good writer. I never thought of myself as a writer, but I was determined to make writing a regular practice for me. Part of that was to help others and increase people's visibility of me and what I had to offer. But more than anything, it was really about me working out my writing skills and working out the ideas in public. And my writing for years at mattnorman.com has been literally working my own stuff out in public. You know, the things that I'm struggling with, the things that I'm learning, the things that I'm reading. And so it's been clarifying for me to do that. And that, I think, really laid the groundwork for me to write my first book, which Four Patterns of Healthy People was really a codification of a lot of the writing I had been doing for several years, working my own growth areas out, as I say, in public in ways that it resonated with others. This book was really a reflection of the course that I mentioned that several years ago that I had designed and that we've been running as a team and by extension have been running across the Dale Carnegie world over the last several years. And I just felt both a burden to increase visibility of these ideas beyond people who have taken this particular course to others that might have access to the book. And then also to get all of these ideas and experiences into writing that have just been stored in my head and in the heads of a lot of my colleagues. And so this was really kind of a relief to write this particular book. You know, my last book was more of a labor of love to try to create the content in that book more or less from scratch. This book was really a relief to get it all written because it was all in my head, in notes and in the heads of others around me. And so it was really about just getting all of this documented, as I say, so that people would be able to benefit from it. And hopefully that has value to others as they're able to, you know, read and experience in a condensed format, all of what we've been learning and observing over the last several years. Well, Matt, I'll tell our listeners a little secret. When you were initially approached by the book publisher, they asked if you needed a writer, right? And you were confident in your writing skills. So, you know, you showed them the manuscript and everybody agreed that you don't need a writer, maybe just an editor to take a look to make sure everything's flowing well. I have to say that your practice and writing has paid off because I think they came back and said, no edits, which is unheard of. I think most things I write, I have to have edited. So I think what that tells the audience here is practice does make perfect. And when you put your heart and soul into something and you really get the opportunity to tell an incredible story, you can do incredible things with growing your own desires and becoming a better writer and so forth. So congratulations. Thanks for saying that. It's true that I've come a long way since really having low confidence in my writing ability. And like you said, I believe that to a degree we can all grow and become proficient in areas that once seemed to be insurmountable. There were a handful of edits, uh, <laughs> so I was fortunate to work with a great editor. There weren't a lot. I was fortunate. And then I have been working with an editor, kind of a writing coach for the last several years, and she's just been so helpful to me. And I think a lot of maybe the lesson need for an editor once the final draft of this book came together was really because over the years, she's been just improving my editing. And also she had even edited portions of what I wrote in the book in past things that I had you know, been thinking about. So it's a team, but definitely, like you say, I think there's a lot of growth that all of us can have in the area of writing or communication skills. That's awesome. I aspire to that too. So I might need her name <laughs> or you can help, yeah. you know, so you're clearly, you're a busy guy. You're a business owner. More importantly, you're a dad and a husband. You train clients, you coach clients and you run multiple territories, so multiple operations. There's a lot of inspiration that led to the book. And I think a lot of inspiration coming out of it and your own personal success story. What part of the book inspires you the most and that you hope that our listeners today take from reading it? I tend to prioritize the urgent. I tend to prioritize getting a lot done in my life and in my work. And I consistently have to be reminded 
that relationships typically aren't cultivated by getting a lot done. Relationships are typically cultivated through availability more than productivity. And so one of the key ideas in the book that continues to inspire me is to be intentional about my availability for relationships, my investment, my proactive investment in relationships, not just being reactive to people's needs, but being proactive in my connection and my influence with people. So that's been a really big continuous reminder and inspiration for me. And the other thing is just to be intentional about how I message my ideas. If I'm in a situation, debating a topic, trying to convince somebody of something, rather than just sort of allowing my stream of consciousness to flow, rather that I would be, have some structure, have some pattern to the way that I allow my thoughts to be heard by others so that it maximizes the receptivity from the other person and the agreeability from the other person. So I think those have been the two big things that continue to inspire and remind me to be available, be proactive, and then also to be thoughtful and intentional about how I message ideas. Yeah, and I think that really transcends from you know our personal lives to our work lives. Being available, proactive is just part of not only being a great inspiration of the people that work for us, but teaches our kids something too, right? Mm -hmm. They really start to learn about how to focus and be disciplined. I think from a lot of those principles and being really a good human and being there when it's most important. So thank you for sharing that. You know, a lot of those that are listening today are probably thinking, where do I start? I'm going to read this great book. Maybe I'll attend one of the classes locally or online. But from your experience, today's January 1st. I'm going to start here. What would you suggest? One would be our self-perception. You know, do we view ourselves as a doer, a fixer, a rescuer, a solver, an expert in our working relationships? Or do we view ourselves fundamentally as an influencer, a collaborator? I think self-perception holds a lot of us back. I think if we're honest about our daily work, even if we're a parent, for example, we may just sometimes get in the mode of thinking that my job is to just solve problems, fill gaps, answer questions, create outputs. And when we get stuck in that thinking of ourselves that way, we tend to, I think, become fairly myopic in our perception of ourselves and of what's possible in the relationships. And maybe we don't optimally position ourselves. So I think that's a starting point is to think, how do I think about myself? What's my self-perception when it comes to my, what we might call stakeholder relationships, relationships with people that have a stake in the work that we do. I think that's number one. And then I think the second one is, as I alluded to earlier, looking at where am I investing my time? Am I investing most of my time answering emails, getting things done, going to meetings, responding to requests, reacting to problems, or am I carving out time to get ahead of things, to have deeper conversations with my stakeholders, to understand the through line of my work to the broader outcomes or shared priorities? Am I doing enough research and planning? Am I investing enough proactively to build relationships and build trust in the connective tissue in those relationships? So I would say those two, I would maybe give a two answer. The starting place I think is self-perception. Do I see myself as more of an influencer or a doer? And then number two is where is my time being invested? Am I investing enough of my time to do the things that would lead to proactive influence? So Matt, you know, a lot of our listeners like me have been in leadership roles for quite some time and I'm a continual learner and I'm always looking to leave people inspired and feel influenced, whether they report into my organization or we work together or... I'm helping lead a team that's working cross-functionally. 
So since many of us kind of fall into that position, what are some of the ideas from the book that you think really help in situations like that, or you would say are go-to places if we kind of fall in that situation? One of them is being more curious rather than leading with our perspective or our expertise. A mantra that I've embraced that's in the book is restrain yourself before you explain yourself. It's so tempting, I think, for us to want to be heard rather than to pause and really understand where other people are coming from. And neuroscience bears this out. I mean, the research of influence suggests that people are five times more likely to buy into an idea if they arrive at the conclusion themselves rather than being told what the idea is. So as we think about whether it's more productive and efficient for us to tell people what we think they should do or tell people the path that we should take, or whether we should ask questions, ask maybe thought-provoking questions that cause other people to come to that realization themselves. And a lot of us may know this intuitively, and yet we struggle. We get into conversations and our excitement, our enthusiasm, our anxiety tends to sometimes win the day. And so in the program and in the book, we have some tools to be able to help us to be more effectively curious. We have a questioning sequence that we can follow and even a way to set up that questioning sequence so that we end up getting better results. Even questioning is an art. We know that there are degrees of questioning effectiveness. While most people don't ask or get asked enough questions in general, there's also levels of quality to questions that we can ask or get asked. And so I think one of the key takeaways for all of us as leaders is just to ask more and better questions, to restrain ourselves before we start to explain ourselves. And that we would ask higher quality questions. And we would think about, are the questions I'm asking really causing people around me to engage both logically and emotionally and to think differently? Are they guiding someone to maybe get closer to a shared commitment. That's great. I, you know, I think from my personal experience, I get so excited sometimes that I just talk and tell versus ask questions and listen and gain buy-in. So really real world explanation there. So thank you. And I think a lot yeah. of people are going to benefit from that advice. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, it's so easy to just tell. seems like that's the path of least resistance, but one of the phrases in the program we talk about a lot is slow is fast, fast is slow. You know, when it comes to interpersonal influence, slow is fast, fast is slow. I need to slow down to speed up. If I slow down and set up a better conversation, ask more and better questions, and then even when I am telling people what I think, that I would slow down to frequently pause, connect my ideas to what they said mattered to them. It's going to take me a bit longer to do that, but then I will accelerate so much faster or we will accelerate out of this conversation so much faster than if in my meetings, if I just go fast and say, well, I'm just gonna tell you what I think. I'm just gonna rip through my slides. I'm just gonna cut to the chase. That is faster up front but it slows us down so much more in terms of getting sustainable engagement. So Matt, this has been amazing. I've so much enjoyed this conversation. I've gotten to read the book and I'm so excited to read it again and to let our listeners get their hands on it. This book is part of a family of award-winning top seller books by the Dale Carnegie family and brand. So thank you for investing your time and both the Dale Carnegie brand and then your own name being the author of this book. It's been inspirational to watch you and to be part of your journey. Let me first say you've been a great partner in this process, Christine. So thank you so much. And Joe Hart and Michael Crom, their example with the book, Take Command and Joe's leadership of our organization really paved the way for this book to happen. And so I'm grateful for that and all of our clients that are discussed in the book or who inspired the book and my team as well. So tell us, when does the book come out? Where can we get it? And if people want to know more about the book or the course, where do they get more information? The book is available on Amazon today, March 12th, as well as through all other major booksellers in various formats. 
You can connect with me at mattnorman.com or on LinkedIn to follow my regular articles. And I highly recommend the Lead with Influence course, which has had a profound impact on many individuals and organizations. Visit dalecarnegie.com for the course and more information. Great. Well, thank you again, Matt, for taking the time. I'm sure that everybody listening today is going to be inspired not only by the story, but about the great book that's coming out and can't wait to get their hands on it. Thanks again. Thanks, Christine. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success and help you take command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and following us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. For more exclusive content, subscribe to our Dale Carnegie YouTube channel and follow us on social media. As always, thank you for listening. And we're looking forward to you joining us for the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.